Welcome to the Managed Funds Association live stream discussion on the future of short selling and its role in financial markets. I'm Michael Padroni, Head of Global Markets and Research at MFA. I'm very pleased to be joined today by economist Jonas Bjark Jensen of Copenhagen Economics and very shortly by veteran short seller Jim Chanos of Kinecos Associates. Today's session is being live streamed and recorded. Uh, we're uh, timing today's event to coincide with the publication of a major research paper by Copenhagen Economics on disclosure requirements for short sale positions. MFA commissioned this research because recent market events have led policymakers and regulators to ask the question, what kind of disclosure framework for short selling works best to protect investors and create the right incentives for short sellers? It's widely accepted that short sellers not only add liquidity to markets, but also help to detect overvalued assets really serving to avoid market um, bubbles and ferret out corporate fraud. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce Jonas Jensen, one of the principal authors of the research paper on short sale disclosure rules, and we'll have a brief discussion. Jonas, welcome. Thank you very much, Michael. Jonas, you observe in the paper that uh, Copenhagen Economics published just today uh, that short selling improves financial markets and helps to detect corporate fraud, as in the cases, for example, of Wirecard and Enron. You also observe that short sale disclosure rules are different in the US and in Europe. In the US, we report aggregate short interest, but not an individual firm's short position. In the EU and UK, uh, they require individual investors to publicly disclose short positions. What is the impact of the EU's individual public disclosure requirement on short sellers? Mm -hmm. So I think the starting point for our study is that, that market participants, of course, are very careful about which signals they send to the market, which information they bring to the market. So the starting point is that this kind of disclosure requirements, as you described, it will change behavior of market participant. That's basically what we've been analyzing the study, which kind of behavior changes do we actually see. And one of the changes that we see is empirically we see that uh, the, the short sell, uh, short sell disclosure requirement, it discourages short selling. So we see less short selling because of the requirement. So ESMA has done a quite of a convincing study where they sort of follow individual uh, investors when they do short sell. And they say typically they come in with a quite sort of a, a low position. Then you can see how they increase their position, uh, their, their short position. But then they find that typically they increase it just below the threshold, the disclosure threshold then typically investors don't want to increase more. So there we can really see that they are quite reluctant to cross this threshold. And therefore we will have a, find that there is less, um, less short selling because of the disclosure requirement. And then as you mentioned, it's sort of uh, quite widely accepted that, that short selling is beneficial for, uh, for price discovery. So when you discourage short selling, you have less, uh, less short positions being taken that uh, impairs um, price discovery. Got it. Okay. So the, the way in which the disclosure threshold functions in Europe, it, it actually, because once you exceed a certain amount of a short position in a, in, a, in a stock, that individual investor has to make a decision, do they wanna surpass that threshold and then uh, disclose it? And you mentioned, I heard you say ESMA, ESMA just for our audience is the European Securities uh, and Markets Authority. Um, so. You know, one of the things, Jonas, that we were really impressed with in this paper is that you formulated a new economic model to show that Europe's individual public disclosure threshold, this reporting requirement, drives uh, what we call herding behavior. Can, can you explain what that means and what you discovered in your research? Yes. So again, we're coming back to which kind of sort of behavior are changing because of this disclosure requirement. And some of the other aspects we looked at was exactly herding behavior. So, of course, when, when market participants, they price assets, they take in all in, uh, available uh, information. And one of this, this information is, have other investors uh, shorted that given asset? And we know also from interviews that that's a very important piece of information. So that could let one to believe that um, the disclosure requirement might lead to sort of copycat investing. So a given investor short a given asset, not because that investor itself uh, have any sort of reason to believe it is sort of overvalued, but because that 
the investors see that there's another investor which they trust have shorted the asset and they sort of believe that they have a good analysis and they just want to copy that that position so that is sort of the, the hypo hypothesis uh, that it could lead to this sort of copycat uh, investing and empirically uh, when we look at it we do actually see that there is indication of, of hurting behavior so basically we see whenever there is a, um, a public uh, disclosure of a short position, it increases the likelihood that in the following days we'll see another public disclosure. We find sort of a 12% increase in the likelihood. Um, that could of course just be because there are a bunch of investors that sort of act to the same news, to the same fundamentals. But we do adjust for that with using various economic techniques and we do find it is actually the disclosure in itself that leads to uh, other disclosures and, and not because they just act to the same uh, piece of information because we control for that in our in our study. Okay, and that's the new piece of evidence here, right? You Not only do you see that the disclosure threshold is um, uh, you know associated with more short selling, this copycat behavior as you describe it, but you actually run some econometric models to show that it's a cause, it's a significant cause of uh, that behavior. Um, so in some ways, you know, with with the U.S. right now, what we're doing is we're looking at um, what the European disclosure framework leads to, and it, it leads to it actually causes some of this hurting behavior. So I can understand if I'm a, a manager, say, of a large company in Europe, and one investor shorts my stock, uh, and then, you know, that investor is is forced to disclose it, I, as the leader of this large company, have to worry that others are gonna jump on the bandwagon and, and short my company even more. So that's that's a clear disadvantage. But you know, looking at it from the perspective of a policymaker, wh why do I care uh, that a mandate for disclosing individual short positions drives hurting behavior? Yeah, that's, that's a good question because of course in itself, you know, regulators uh, wouldn't care so much about that some investors have their position being, being copied. The problem is that in general that, that it's quite sort of acknowledged that hurting behavior and hurting in financial market, it leads to increased volatility in the market. So it leads to less efficient prices, basically. Um, so that's sort of in general why regulators tend to design regulation to, to, to avoid uh, hurting um, in, in, in the market. In this case, we actually also do find that at, at disclosure, public disclosure, that leads to an increase in volatility. So we actually do find a sort of direct link from, um, from a disclosure to a higher volatility. And we see, it seems that it's due to sort of an exaggerated downward uh, adjustment when there is a disclosure, because we also see sort of a more uh, lower returns that otherwise would have been for a given stock when uh, there is a disclosure there. So it seems that there, there is sort of an exaggerated downward adjustment when there is a, a disclosure that leads to this uh, higher volatility that, uh, that we observe. Got it. So that disclosure requirement not only hurts the, um, you know, the company in a sense, but it also hurts all investors through this volatility channel. As, as you get higher volatility, that's not going to affect just the investor and the company. It's going to um, affect your kind of retail investors as well. Um, well, Jonas, you know, thank you for the, the great uh, collaboration on this, for your insights today and for your efforts in adding to the body of research showing that you know, even when controlling for other factors, requiring individual investors to public, publicly disclose short positions is damaging and counterproductive to maintaining uh, deep and, and liquid capital markets. And so now uh, I would like to introduce uh, Jim Chanos, uh, who really needs no introduction. Uh, Jim founded Kinecos Associates in 1985 and is also a professor at the Yale School of Management, where he teaches a course on a history of financial market fraud, a forensic approach. Jim has spotted many of the most significant irregularities in markets over the years, including most famously Enron, as portrayed in the book and film titled The Smartest Guys in the Room. Um, joining Jim for a conversation on short selling today are my MFA colleagues, Andrew Lowenthal, Jennifer Hahn, and Jillian Flores. Uh, these are MFA's heads of policy regulation and government relations, respectively. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for the introduction and for teeing up our conversation with Jim today with Copenhagen's really groundbreaking research. One of the things that we're gonna segue uh, from is we've heard 
a lot of the qualitative impact of what short selling regulation that's ill conceived can do to markets. These are new numbers. Um, and what we're going to do with Jim, though, is to put a little bit of um, qualitative uh, gloss on, on the conversation and to understand, I think, for our audience, what exactly it is, why managers are reluctant to cross that threshold, and then a little bit about what the herding does and then how that will impact on the markets in general. So, Jim, one of the things that, that, that Copenhagen looked at was Wirecard, which is a fascinating story in so many ways. One of which was is that the fear of crossing that threshold may have kept the aggregate short interest lower than what the true market sentiment was about the company. And therefore, there's a distortion, I think, if you're just looking at things on what the market sentiment and the price discovery is. But one thing that we didn't ask Copenhagen to do was to drill down as to why um, so many fund managers may have been reluctant to expose themselves to that public scrutiny. And could you just talk a little bit about what happened specifically with Wirecard, um, which is uh, still the reverberations of which are still ongoing um, uh, a little bit? Well, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, uh, MFA, for, for having me this afternoon. Um, Wirecard is a particularly interesting example of the, the problem of short selling disclosure. My firm, as I think you know, was short Wirecard. We publicly disclosed that. But we stayed under the threshold reporting requirements because like uh, with other short sellers who had done a lot of investigative work on Wirecard, as we did, um, it was becoming very clear that there was a, a campaign of retaliation that was uh, ongoing, not only uh, against uh, the, the critics of the company, in the marketplace, but also uh, financial journalists, um, most notably uh, Dan McCrum at the Financial Times. Um, but this this really put a chilling effect on on people wanting to take full positions or disclose their names because of the nature uh, of what Wirecard was doing. And I think we're going to see even more of that come out in the coming months and years as uh, some of the press accounts turn into books. Um, and, uh, and recollections. Uh, this really does have a chilling effect on, on the ability of the marketplace to see uh, what was happening. And I think a larger short position would have signaled just fine to the marketplace that there were indeed concerns uh, that were building as time went on in Wirecard. But because of the company's efforts uh, that were, were so aggressive, uh, again, firms like mine uh, held back on, on shorting uh, even more because of, uh, of that concern. And, and in the case of Wirecard, it was extreme. And unfortunately, uh, although Wirecard is extreme, it is very recent. It's something that happened really within the last 12 to 18 months. So it's um, uh, regrettable that at the very time the U.S. is starting to think about some of those disclosure uh, ideas, ideas in which they've uh, both securities uh, regulators in the U.S. and Congress have thought about before and discarded because of some of these problems. We have this really extreme example. Now, there are some folks who would say that it's really easy to fix this. Oh, all that has to happen is the SEC can grant confidential treatment to you, the short seller, um, based upon based upon that. Um, one, putting aside for a minute whether or not by expressing an economic view through uh, a transaction, you should have to go seek some sort of protection. But Jen Han, who's our chief counsel, is there any mechanism in the securities laws to actually grant confidential treatment for something like a fear of retaliation rather than something that's a pure economics or market price discovery mechanism? No, unfortunately, at the moment, the securities laws aren't written this way. Now, the SEC does have an ability to provide, to grant limited confidential treatment or confidential protection, but that's really with respect to the acquisition or disposition of securities. And they've granted it in very limited circumstances in, in the past. And so usually once you are done with acquisition or disposition, but it really, there is no construct under the current law for issuer retaliation to, to 
grant that confidential treatment because you're afraid of the harm that you would get from issuer retaliation. Thanks. So really what, what happens is, is that as we push this forward, not only do we see that the markets are impacted, that behavior has changed, that risk management has changed, but to do some of the things that proponents of such a, a regime propose, we'd really have to start rewriting some fundamental ideas of the securities laws. And now getting into the herding kind of mechanisms, which we heard a little bit about, um, what happens is you could imagine then um, if you did grant treatment for fear of retaliation, then people could say, well, there's an inference there that the SEC thinks that there's some legitimacy to the uh, claim, which is something the SEC has always taken a very um, uh, aggressive means to keep itself out of being either perceived as long or short or giving uh, any kind of uh, imprimatur to a investment and investment thesis. You know, Jim, the issue of retaliation has really not been confined to wire card. And I think um, you, you've talked in a number of instances about that and about also the incentives for a corporate management to retaliate um, a, as well. I was wondering if you could touch a, a little bit on that, but, but maybe perhaps before that is one of these sort of laws of unintended consequences on the herding behavior. Uh, there's an instructive example that you were in fact a part of back at the beginning of the financial crisis when um, a, a series of financial institutions in Europe had their uh, the people who were short them uh, revealed. And maybe you could touch on that and then um, and just expand a little bit upon your experiences when, um, when you do have to go up against a, 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 an issuer with nothing to lose. Right. So I, I think the uh, I think the example that you're talking about uh, occurred right of uh, pretty much uh, the, at the height of the uh, the GFC in September of 2008. And uh, if you recall, Europe had had uh, initiated a disclosure regime um, in uh, in that that period. And uh, in the third, I believe it was the third week of September of 08. Um, the, uh, I was in our London office at that time, and uh, that Monday morning, I believe it was the week after Lehman, um, they began disclosing uh, the firms that were short various different stocks in Europe. And uh, to my horror and, and others, um, one of the first companies that, that crossed the tape that morning was Ireland. And it came out that my firm and, and other uh, somewhat well-known hedge funds had been short the Irish banks. Now, this is not anything we felt, you know, we needed to talk about publicly. We never disclosed it. Um, it was, it was a, a position because we thought those banks were insolvent. And in fact, it, it was as if the market had a heart attack that morning and everybody at, at the same point said, oh yes, the Irish banks, we forgot about the Irish banks. It took them uh, hours to open some of the banks. They opened down 20, 30, 40%. Um, credit default swaps uh, blew out for the Irish banks. And um, we all know what happened after that. Um, I think that almost every hedge fund that had to disclose their position would have preferred not to in that particular case. And what it points to is that this kind of disclosure regime can, can sometimes be pro-cyclical in a bad way. 10 years into a bull market or 11 years into a bull market, it seems that the idea would be, well, if we disclose the names, maybe there'll be less of this activity. Uh, on the other hand, in a, in a bear market or certainly a credit, credit uh, uh, collapse, as we saw in 08, um, maybe it's not in the best interest of what policyholders are trying to do to name names. And I think that, that you can have this law of unintended consequences affect you at different times and different cycles in ways in which policymakers don't understand or don't maybe appreciate. No, that's a great point. Um, and I think that so the second the second part of your question. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Andrew. No, no, no. I was I was gonna I was gonna prompt you to the second part of my question, but I but so so the the, the the problem with issuer retaliation on many fronts is that often it's the bad guys who are using shareholders' money to defend themselves. And the idea is not to basically take the short sellers to court. No one ever really wants to get that far. 
because no corporation or their board wants people uh, uh, to have access through uh, discovery to the corporate files to defend themselves. So the idea is really to, to try to uh, quiet free speech and, and to squash it in, in, a, in a way that I think is, is uh, deleterious to the marketplace. But you don't have to believe me. Um, a far better market player than me, 100 years ago before the house, Bernard Baruch said, and I'm gonna read it, a market without bears uh, would be like a nation without a free press. Uh, there would be no one to criticize and restrain the false optimism that always leads to disaster. And, and again, these attempts at, at intimidation by uh, uh, basically running up legal bills and, and making life difficult for the critics uh, of, of companies. And there are plenty of ways of legal redress for legitimate complaints against libel, slander, and securities fraud. But so many of these cases are really to defend the poor uh, uh, the judgment and or uh, malfeasance of corporate insiders. And to chill that, is really uh, counterproductive to what I think the marketplace is trying to do, which is to encourage uh, uh, people to point out the problems at companies uh, that, that may be glossing these over or more ominously um, intentionally trying to deceive their investors in the marketplace. And I think anything we do in, in to, to basically make that more difficult uh, is a harmful effect on our markets. No, thank you, Jim. And and I think that that makes a, a point about sort of what we've heard actually in Congress. So what's fascinating is we have an effort here in Congress to, uh, which used to be pushed by a bunch of corporate issuers who didn't like being criticized and it had some things in the past. And it's gotten gussied up in a couple of different ways these days because, oh, disclosure it must be good and there's not a lot of thought about that. But the conversations we've actually had in Congress, the, the two times that post GameStop and Archegos that it's been discussed in the committee has been very different, I think, in terms of tone and tenor. And Jillian, just from what we heard at the very beginning from what uh, Mr. Plotkin and Melvin Capital talked about when he was, his firm was exposed as, as, as individually. And then also we had the chair of the SEC talk about short selling too in May. Uh, in a pretty positive way. And just maybe you want to refresh our memory on that, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Andrew. So in the past six months, Congress has taken several opportunities to explore the issues that arose out of GameStop. And in particular, um, short sale issues have come up and have largely been acknowledged as uh, not something that needed fixing. So, you know, time and again, participants at hearings before the House Financial Services Committee and the Senate Banking Committee have acknowledged the vital role of short selling in the markets. And this includes, of course, SEC Chair Gensler. In addition, there has been an acknowledgement that existing authority is sufficient at the SEC to make enhancements to aggregate disclosure. And there have been really no, no ways that uh, uh, a witness has articulated any sort of benefit in adding individual short sale disclosure. So we've been very comforted to see that there's a broad acknowledgement that something this drastic does not make sense. Uh, nonetheless, there are some policymakers that are exploring it. Thanks. And, and I think that that's really sort of the, the, the big issue that we've been driving at because MFA and the industry, I think broadly, very much wants disclosures. You know, I think the industry has been pushing for weekly aggregate short disclosure and, and, and made available and free to all investors, to put all investors, give all investors the same sets of tools and information that they can use to make investment decisions with their own capital or the capital that they may be managing under 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 the securities rules. So the, the the confluence and the sort of the flip to let's expose let's expose short sellers and let's put that out there, um, you know, really seems to be working across the market. And it's not always. And I think companies may find and 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 you know, Jim has alluded to this as well. You're not always short a company because of fraud. You may be short because you think company X has a weaker reopening plan than company Y, and it's a relative value 
uh, trade, you've paired a trade, or you're short one sector or long a sector in order to have a market neutral strategy, which is phenomenally important to so many hedge fund investors. Again, you know, for those who, who may not know, 26 million American pensioners depend on hedge funds for parts of their returns and where their investments come from the market neutral side, where you're not caught up in as Bernard Baruch noted, the great enthusiasms and the great asset bubbles. There's also something, and, and, and well, I'd like to invite our audience also, please, in the chat to ask questions. We have some time for Jim. But Jim, you know, I, I, I would ask you sort of putting on your professorial hat um, to think about, you know, is there a correlation really as we look across the globe um, between markets where short selling is kind of allowed and encouraged like in the US and societies where it becomes harder and harder to criticize companies because those companies may be linked up to the government. So for example, well, uh, Russia and China have very different ideas about short selling than we have traditionally in the United States. Well, I'll, I'll put my historian hat on. Uh, I'll go one further, Andrew, and say that, that uh, it's been well noted by me and others that one of the first things that authoritarian governments do when they come to power is restrict short selling in their financial markets. Um, so it goes right to, uh, right to your, your observation about linked uh, to, to state sponsored uh, uh, companies or corruption. And so again, I think it gets back to this whole idea that the short sellers are, are indeed an extra, uh, an extra piece of sunlight in the marketplace that should be welcomed, but uh, they should not be uh, hounded um, personally for doing that. And one other point on that note, uh, you mentioned Melvin Capital and what happened earlier this year, uh, um, uh, Jillian did, I believe. Uh, in this day of social media and doxing, we have a lot of asymmetries that go on in the marketplace. And, and, and short sellers and hedge funds understand that. They, they understand that uh, the, the tax laws are not as uh, uh, conducive to short selling, for example, and a lot of other things. But what we've also seen in this day and age is, uh, is the, the fact that you actually get personal retribution, not just legal retribution, where threats were made to, uh, to short sellers' families and loved ones, and their addresses were doxxed, and, and all kinds of things like that. And I think almost nobody would want to encourage that. Uh, it's in a, the marketplace is an exchange of ideas, but when we raise the issue of personal security, um, it, you, you really begin to cross a lot of lines. And, and this is yet another concern that a number of us have. Uh, and I think, Jim, that's a, that's a sobering but appropriate place maybe for us to pause our conversation. Um, you know, that is, in fact, I think the, that asymmetry short selling in the United States, you know, appropriately so, is more expensive and difficult to do. We are an optimistic society. We don't like to make it super easy for people to punch holes in folks' dreams. What we do want to do is allocate a capital efficiently. And what we forget sometimes is those fraudulent companies, the longer they go, they're sucking out capital from legitimate people and legitimate businesses that have the best ideas, that have things that can solve you know, problems in society. And that is exactly the purpose for which our markets work. And when we unbalance that, boy, you know, we, we just perpetuate, I think, the ideas that the markets aren't serving all Americans and that they're all on one side. And, and that's where we get into, as Copenhagen said, volatility or whatever, where you have these big highs and big lows um, and nothing buffering in between and no voices that warn people to say, hey, you know what, maybe we don't want to put all, all of your family savings on you know, 21 red or 21 black as it were um, in the marketplace. Jim, well, we have one minute left. I'll ask you to, to maybe leave us if you have an uplifting note or idea for us about um, about the role of short selling and some of the good that it's done uh, before we start our week. Well, I, I think you made a great point at the, at the end there, Andrew, in that, that the whole idea is we want to avoid externalities on both sides of the marketplace. And when, when citizens think that the markets are rigged because of nefarious behavior by corporations, as we saw after the dot-com and the wave of fraud that, that came to light post.com, it wasn't just Enron, it was WorldCom and Tyco and, and others. Um, you get people that, to then close up their pocketbooks and say, well, I'm just not going to invest because this is a rigged game. And I think that that's what we also want to avoid. We want to try to ferret out the bad actors as soon as possible and avoid giving them billions in capital that could be 
deployed much, much more efficiently and profitably and legally uh, into the marketplace as opposed to funding the negative cash flow of the bad actors. And so uh, all of these things fit into the, the, uh, the bucket of unintended consequences. But having done this for 40 years, I know, I know they exist. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we really preach Jim Chanos, a founder of Kinecos Associates, Jillian Flores, uh, head of uh, U.S. Government Affairs for the Managed Funds Association, Jennifer Hahn, uh, chief counsel of the MFA, Michael Padroni, um, and Dr. Jensen from uh, uh, Copenhagen Economics. We appreciate your time and thank you very much and look to this space for future and more updates on this 